In this course, you'll learn how to use the amazing Webflow CMS for building professional, responsive websites with no code. Let's go. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to a new Tuts Plus course. My name is Adi. I'm a web designer and developer. And today we're talking about Webflow and uh, not just talking, we're actually doing stuff. But what is Webflow, you might ask? Webflow is a content management system that has an amazing visual designer. The best part, it's code free. So anyone can use it to create a wide range of website types from blogs to online stores. And this is a course for complete beginners. I'm going to assume that you know absolutely nothing about web development or Webflow. So I'll just give you the information you need to get started. The basics. Webflow is a pretty complex beast. So I don't think it's a good idea to go through everything right now. Because of that, we'll focus on three areas. First, I'll give you an introduction to how websites are built on the web, and I'll explain the box model. Then we'll cover the Webflow designer. And finally, I'll show you how to publish a website with Webflow and talk about pricing. Because Webflow is free, but up to a point, uh, you have to pay for some more advanced features like uh, publishing on a custom domain, but all the learning that we're going to be doing in this course can be done on the free version. So yay for that. Now during the course, I'll be demoing things using templates and assets from Envato Elements. Uh, I use this a lot in my web design projects, but also for video content. And it's super simple for me. For a monthly fee, I get unlimited downloads of web templates, fonts, icons, audio files, pictures of cats, video effects, you name it. There's tons of stuff on Elements and you get commercial licensing for all of it. Also, if you're not happy with the service, you can cancel anytime. So I highly recommend it. And if you're interested, check out the link in the video description. Now, uh, let's get started by learning a little bit about how websites are built on the web and what kind of technologies are used. I think it's important to start this course by understanding how websites are built on the web because that's gonna help you understand how Webflow functions at its core. In the end, it uses the same technologies. So we'll talk about three things, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. This is also known as the Holy Trinity because it's the basis of everything we do in terms of front end development. Uh, let's start with HTML. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language, and it's a language that we use to define the structure of our web content, but also give meaning to the various elements we're using, for example, titles, paragraphs, and we can also use HTML to embed media like images and videos. And to see the HTML code that powers any web page, you can just open it in your browser, you can right click anywhere and choose view page source. And this will show you the raw HTML that's behind everything you see on this page, which is pretty cool. Alternatively, in most browsers, you can right click an element, you can inspect it, and that's going to open up an inspector window. And this will again, show you the HTML here, but it will also show you some uh, of the CSS properties. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, with the inspector, you have the added advantage of being able to select various elements like this link here, or you can select this div element. And that's going to be highlighted here in the canvas. So you can see exactly what HTML code is responsible for what element in your page. And that's the HTML. It's the markup language that defines the structure of a web page. But what about using pretty colors or fonts like uh, Papyrus or Comic Sans? Well, that's where CSS comes in. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets, and it's a language that we use to style the HTML content. With CSS, we can set 
colors, fonts. We can choose how to display certain images or elements in the page. We can set how big a font should be, whether or not it should be normal, underline. Basically, everything you see on this page, all the visual characteristics, all the aesthetics are being controlled by the CSS. And again, if we want to inspect or see some of the CSS code or properties, we can do that with the inspector in most browsers. So once you open the inspector, uh, besides the HTML here on the top, you'll find some CSS code right here. And these are what we call selectors. And these are the actual styles that we're applying. Position absolute, top, left, zero. We're setting a width and a height of 100%. And here, uh, Firefox, which is the browser that I'm using, actually shows us some of the properties that are applied to the selected element in a more readable format. So that's CSS. It's the language that we use for styling web pages. Now, let's talk about JavaScript. JavaScript stands for JavaScript, and it's a scripting or programming language that allows us to add more complex behaviors to our web pages. Things like displaying a drop down menu, like this, or switching the tab contents, like this, or maybe displaying a modal window, like this one. There are lots and lots of uses for JavaScript. And this is a tool that you can use to enhance the overall experience of your website. So in this lesson, we talked about how websites are built because that helps us understand how Webflow works. We learned about HTML, which is the markup language that defines the structure of a web page. We learned that all the styling is done by the CSS, which is a language used to describe how colors and fonts are applied and how various elements are laid in a page. And finally, we talked about JavaScript, which is a programming language that's used for implementing complex behaviors in web pages. These three technologies are the building blocks for web development, but also Webflow. Any page that you create within Webflow is built using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Now, before we start building with Webflow, let's learn about the box model. Let me start by giving you the shortest version of this lesson. Every element in a web page sits in a box. If you want a more in-depth, more scientific explanation, it goes like this. Every element in a web page sits in a box. And if that doesn't convince you, then let me show you some hard evidence. In order to understand the box model, you need to first understand that everything in CSS has a box around it. And understanding these boxes is the key to creating layouts with CSS or aligning items. And to demonstrate, I created a very good looking demo page here. I wrote some HTML, I added some images. I also added some CSS. And to show you that yes, indeed, every element in a page sits in a box, I added a border to all the elements. And if I turn on that border, you can see the boxes. So we have one box, another box, another box. And then here we have a bigger box, a slightly smaller box, and then some additional boxes. We have a box for the image, a box for the title, a box for the paragraph. We have a box for the image, a box for, you get the point. So as you can see, this entire page is made out of boxes. And the size of each box is determined by the size of its content. It's not always the case, but usually that's what happens. See, here we have a relatively small or short box. This box is just as wide, but it's taller than this one. 
And then we have this box with the pineapple that is smaller than both of these. Why? Because the content inside the box is smaller. Look at this one. This is smaller than all the others because it has the smallest content inside. And also notice something very important. These boxes, they're not floating around aimlessly. They're displayed from top to bottom, stacked one on top of the other. Well, with the exception of these three, which are stacked one next to another. That's the power of CSS. But you'll see that we can easily compare the order in our markup with what we see in the screen. So this first H1 corresponds to this first box and it's displayed at the very top. The next element in our HTML is this paragraph and this corresponds to this one. It's just another box that was placed under the first one. And the examples can go on and on. We have another box and then another box and that box contains other smaller boxes and so on and so forth. And if I were to remove a box, for example, the second paragraph, if I were to delete this, see that when that box disappears, it affects the rest of the flow, the rest of the document. All the other boxes are now pushed up because we have available space. So that just goes to show that these elements are not floating around. They're displayed in a certain manner in every browser. Usually that's from top to bottom. So as you can see, a web page is made out of boxes. And if you're still not convinced, even after this scientific explanation, then you can scroll down the page and this will definitely prove it to you. So that's the box model. That's how we build for the web. In this lesson, we learned that elements are not floating around aimlessly, like George Clooney in the movie Gravity. Instead, they stack vertically or horizontally. We also learned that each element sits in a box of its own and that the size of the box is definitely determined by its contents, sometimes, but not always. And finally, we learned that cats are not evil and their plan is not to take over the world. So, with that out of the way, let's uh, open up Webflow and start learning how to use it. First, let's look at the user interface. Webflow is a CMS, which stands for Content Management System. So, it's a system that allows us to manage content. It's not the only one out there, but it's one of the best because of something called the designer. And this is a way for us to visually manipulate the HTML and CSS in the page. Now, we'll be working a lot with the designer in this course. But first, we need to take a look at the user interface and learn how to work with it. For the user interface, we can actually split it in four major sections. We have the left toolbar, the top toolbar, the canvas, and the panels on the right. So let's start with the left toolbar. When you open Webflow, you'll find the left toolbar on the left side. And from here, you can access the most important sections in the CMS. We have a menu here on the top that allows us to switch to the dashboard or the project settings or the editor. Then we have the add panel, which allows us to add elements and components in our page or use any of the pre-built layouts that come with Webflow. Then we have access to the symbols. We can create a new symbol by clicking this button or we can view a list of all existing symbols here. We have the navigator, which we can always pin so it's permanently displayed on the left side. And this allows us to browse the contents of our page in this tree format. And at any time, we can click this icon to collapse everything. And we can also select the various 
sections in our page. Speaking of pages, by clicking this icon, we have access to all the pages in our document, and we can easily switch between them just like this. We can also create new folders, new pages, and we can search for a specific page. Here we have access to our CMS collections. This is a bit more advanced. We also have access to the assets. This contains a list of all the images or documents or Lottie animations that uh, we uploaded to our Webflow project. And from here, it's really easy to use an asset. We can simply click and drag into our page. And finally, we have access to some settings. So that's the left toolbar. Now, let's see about the top toolbar. You can find this right here on the top, and this shows us the current page we're in. We have a preview button, which we can use to toggle in and out of the preview. Then we have controls for the responsive side of web design. We can switch between various breakpoints by either clicking on each one to preview our website in different screen sizes. We can also press one, two, three, or four to switch between these faster. Here, undo, redo. This is a, an icon we can click to export our HTML, CSS, or JavaScript code. Here, we can share a project, we can publish it, and that's the top toolbar. Now, let's see about the canvas. This is the biggest section in the UI. It's this right here where we can see a preview of our project. And we can fully interact with this canvas. We can click on any particular element, select it, just like this. We can resize it by hovering right here on the right side and then dragging to make it bigger. Or when we're viewing on smaller breakpoints, we can click and drag between certain predefined ranges to resize our canvas. So that's the canvas. Now the final section of the user interface is this one. Positioned on the right side, we have a collection of panels. And instead of referring to these as the right-hand side panels, let's call them the inspector. Because in here, you can inspect the various properties of the selected object. For example, if I select this paragraph, and I know it's a paragraph because it has the P symbol right here. Over on the right side, we can see its class. More about that in a future lesson. We have controls for the layout of the element, the spacing. I can increase the margin like this. I can increase the padding of the element just like this. I can hold down shift and that will change the padding on all four sides, just like so. I can hold down Alt, and that's going to affect either top or bottom, or left and right. And if at any point I want to get rid of one of these values, I can either click it and reduce it to whatever value I need, or I can reset it or I can hold option and left click, and that's gonna reset it as well. Then we have controls for the size, the position, typography controls, background, borders, effects, all this good stuff. So anything that you can control via CSS is nicely organized in these panels. You have some additional options then by clicking this cog icon. You'll find custom attributes. You can set IDs to various elements. From here, we also have access to the style manager. This will show us all the classes, the subclasses that are being used in the project. 
and you can even search for any given class. And then finally, this is the panel for interactions. This is where you create animations in Webflow. So in this lesson, we learned that Webflow is a CMS and that it's one of the best on the market thanks to something called the designer. This is used to visually manipulate the HTML and CSS in the page. And we learned that it's made of four big sections, the left toolbar, the top toolbar, the canvas and the panels on the right, which we collectively called the inspector. Okay, so now that we have all this information, let's move on to everyone's favorite activity, knitting. And while we're doing that, let's also learn about adding and editing elements in Webflow. Building layouts with Webflow is super simple because there are tons of elements we can drag and drop in our canvas. So in this lesson, we're going to learn two things, adding and editing elements. Let's start with adding. There are several ways to add an element in Webflow. First, we need to open the add panel. We can do that by clicking here or pressing A on the keyboard. From here, we need to find the element that we want to drag in, and then we can click and drag directly on our canvas. Depending on the element type, we might get some additional options right off the bat. Like for example, for a heading, we get to choose the heading type. And then once we close this, we can see the element is right here in our canvas and also in our navigator. We can also open the elements panel and we can click on an element, for example, this grid, and that's going to be placed immediately after our heading. And of course, we can always change its position by clicking and dragging in the inspector. We can, of course, delete an element from the inspector, or we can duplicate it. We can select the element, command or control C, and then command or control V. It's a basic copy paste. And this is another fast way of creating elements in Webflow. However, there is an even faster way and that's by using quick find. So let's say I want to add a button or a paragraph after these headings. I can press command E on a Mac and I can type in button and then I just hit enter. I want a paragraph. That's fine. Command E paragraph. And then I can even click it from here. So that's quick find. And if you're using a different operating system, that's fine. You can go to the help keyboard shortcuts, and this will give you all the shortcuts that are available for your operating system. I'm using a Mac. So for me, quick find can be opened with command E or command K. So let's see if that works. Command K. And it does work. So that's adding. What about editing? Well, it depends on the element. For elements that contain text, for example, a heading, you can simply double click and edit the contents or a paragraph, same thing, or a button, same thing. However, for elements that do not contain text, for example, an image. So let's drag an image into our page. There are several ways to edit. There is a nice menu that pops up or a nice panel that pops up after you add that image and you have the ability to choose the image from your assets. And in here, you can also set the width, the height, the alt text and how to load that image. But alternatively, you can also select that element and you can open up the settings panel here in the inspector. And you will get the same image settings, but a few extra as well. Or you can open the main style panel 
in the inspector and work on things like the layout, the margin, the padding, the size, and all the other properties that are editable from this place. Same goes for any element. I can click this button and maybe I want to change its background size or its background color. I can just scroll down to the background section and I can choose a different color for it. I can change the hue, I can change the opacity. I can see the color value in both hex and HSBA format, which is awesome. I can create swatches so I can reuse the same color over and over again. And that's how you can edit an element in Webflow. So in this lesson, we learned that it's really simple to build in Webflow. You can add elements via drag and drop or by using quick find, and you can edit them by either double clicking to edit text or just click to select and then use the inspector panel to change the properties. Now, the next step in our journey of eternal enlightenment takes us to a fun concept, classes, and along with that, inheritance. In CSS, a class represents an identifier. It's like a name. And based on that name, we can style multiple elements the exact same way. Well, in Webflow, classes are pretty much the same. So in this lesson, I'm going to show you how to create a class, how to style elements based on their tag, and we'll also talk about inheritance. Let's start with classes. In Webflow, classes are displayed right here under the selector. They're displayed in blue. And for example, this element here has a class of main heading. The classes are also displayed in the canvas right next to the element type. And at any point, we can click this arrow to rename a class, to duplicate a class, but also to remove a class. So how does this work exactly? If we scroll down and we select this icon, we can see it has a class of feature icon. So does this one. And this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. So what what happens when I select this, for example, and I change some of the properties? Let's say I want to increase the bottom margin. So I can click and drag and see what happens. This change is being applied to all the elements that are using the feature icon class. I can option click to reset its value. I can set this to, let's say five pixels, and that's going to apply to everything. It doesn't matter what element I select with this class. Any change that I make to it will be applied to all the other elements because I'm changing the class. So this will automatically translate to all the other elements that are using that class. I can also create a combo class. And a combo class allows me to make individual changes to just one element. So let's say I want this feature icon to have an even greater bottom margin. I can click here and I can type to create a new combo class. Let's call this special icon. So this created the combo class of special icon. And from here, I can go in and I can change that margin to whatever value I want. And notice that the other icons that are using the base class did not receive this final change. If I want to apply it, awesome. I can click here. I can search for special icon. Webflow tells me, hey, we have some existing combo classes and I can just click on one 
And now I'm using the combo class on this element as well. I want to remove it. Great. I can just click remove and we're back where we started. Now, if an element does not have a class, like for example, this heading two, I can create one. I can click here and I can say RD heading two. And I just created a class. Do I want to apply this to other elements? I can do that. I can select them and I can search for RD heading two. And now whatever change I make to an element that uses this class, for example, let's change the color, any other element that uses that class will change as well. And at any point, I can see all my existing classes by going to the style manager or pressing G on our keyboard. So here, if we search for Adi, we will find Adi heading two. So that's classes. Now there are situations where you can style elements based on their tag. For example, let's select this title. It says heading three. These titles here are also heading threes, but notice that we don't have any class applied to them. So then if we make a change to one of these headings, for example, changing their color to green, only the one that we selected is changed. And Webflow automatically created a heading class for us. But let's say that we want all the H3 headings to receive this change. Well, that's easy to do. We can click here. And instead of selecting or creating a class, we can select all H3 headings. And now I can go in and make my change. And that's going to apply to every single H3 heading. So now if I select uh, an H3 and I change the color to blue, for example, you can see that again, we are working on a single element. So that change will not perpetuate. But instead, if I select all headings, or all H3 headings, I can make that change. And this works for a lot of the elements. For example, a paragraph, right? I can select all paragraphs. Or maybe I have this heading two. I can select all H2 headings. Of course, this works for any element that has an HTML tag. So for example, if I select this container, right? This is a custom element. It doesn't exist in HTML. Therefore, I cannot select all container tags. They don't exist. All right, that was styling elements based on their tag. Now, let's talk about inheritance. And just like in CSS, inheritance in Webflow is about passing down values from parent to children. And the children can choose to keep those values or just like in real life, completely ignore them. Let's see an example. I have selected a section and on this section, I have a couple of properties that are highlighted with orange and I have a couple that are highlighted with blue. This is really important. Orange values are being inherited in this case, from the body element. Blue values are basically overwrites or resets. So what does that mean? Notice we have a font here applied to this section, and that font is Roboto. 16 pixels, 22 pixels of line height. Now, if I were to select the body element and select the HTML tag that says body all pages, notice this is not inheriting those font properties from anywhere. We're actually setting those font properties. So I can change the font family from Roboto to maybe Roboto condensed. And once I do that, notice that 
all the elements that were inheriting those properties from the parent element are also changed. Do I want a bigger font size? Let's say 21 pixels. That's fine. I set it here and all the elements that were inheriting that font size are now displaying the updated value. So now I can select, for example, the nav link and see that for the font, yes, we're using Roboto condensed and this is inherited from body all pages. It's the value that we set previously. Same goes for the font size, 21 pixels. Now at any point, I can make a change here. I can say, okay, for these elements that have this class, navlink, I want to use Roboto, in which case I'm overwriting the values that I received or inherited from my parent, and I want the size to be 16 pixels. So notice that both of these values are now highlighted with blue. That means I am overriding the value that I inherited from the parent. And by doing that, I can now go to the body element and I can select body all pages. And it doesn't really matter what kind of change I make now. Let's say I change the fonts here to great vibes. All the other elements which are inheriting the properties have updated accordingly, but these, which I just edited, are still using the font that I set for them. If I go in here and I click and I reset, well, now that's going to use the value that's being inherited. That's all there is to it. It's a simple concept, but yet very, very powerful. Just remember that values are being passed down from parent to child. So if I set a value or a property on the body element, that property will be passed down to all of its children. If I set a value or a property on the navigation, that's going to be passed down to the container, which is a child of the navigation, and so on and so forth. That's exactly how CSS works. That's where the cascading word comes from. So then, in this lesson, we learned about classes and inheritance in Webflow. We learned that a class can style multiple elements the same way, and a combo class can be used to make small tweaks to just a few elements. We also learned that styling can be applied to all tags of a certain type without using a class. And finally, we talked about inheritance or the passing down of values from parent to child. And we learned that properties in orange inherit the value, while the ones in blue override it. Now, classes allow us to reuse styles. And the concept of reusing is great because it saves time. In Webflow, you can also reuse content by using symbols. So let's talk about those next. In Webflow, symbols allow us to reuse content. If we make a change to a symbol, then all the other instances will be automatically updated. We can even create an override for a specific instance, so only that one is affected. So in this lesson, I'm going to show you how to create a symbol, how to create overrides for a particular instance, and also how to unlink a symbol. Let's start by creating one. Let's say that we like this section here so much that we want to reuse it in other pages, but we don't want to change its properties or the way it looks every time in all of the pages. Well, for that, we can select the parent, which is called small features row, and we can go to the symbols panel and we can create a new symbol. 
let's call this row of content, create symbol. So now we can switch the page by clicking here and going to a different page. And then we can open up the symbols and we can click and drag our symbol in our page. Notice this is an instance of the main symbol. We can always double click and that's gonna edit the symbol itself. For example, I can select this text and I can edit to say rules instead of custom rules. And I can click anywhere outside to exit edit mode. So now the symbol instance in this page says rules. If we go back to the home page, it also says rules. So the changes that I made to the symbol are automatically applied to all the instances of that symbol. And you can double click any instance to enter edit mode for that symbol, regardless of where the instance is. And then to exit edit mode, you can just click outside or press escape on your keyboard. And all of your symbols can be found here in the symbols panel. I believe there is also a shortcut. So if we go to the help keyboard shortcut, you can see that we can press shift A to show the symbols panel or command shift A to make the selected element a symbol. And a symbol can be just an element. For example, I can select this paragraph and I can press command shift A and that's gonna create a symbol or it can be a group of elements. For example, I can select this entire section and make it into a symbol. So that's creating symbols. And as you saw, making a change to the symbol will automatically translate to all the other instances. But we can override this. We can do that with symbol overrides. To demonstrate, let's select this plan wrapper and let's do command shift a to create a symbol let's call it pricing plan create symbol and just for the sake of the demo let's switch to our test page let's delete this and let's open the symbols panel with shift a from here i'm going to drag in pricing plan but let's make this more interesting let's first add a grid and with the grid selected, let's add an extra column and let's delete one of the rows. And we're gonna click done. Now let's add the pricing plan to our grid and let's add it again and again. I just copy and paste it. So now if I open pricing plan and I make a change, for example, I'm gonna change this first value to 20 a month. All the other instances are updated as well, but I don't want that. I want to be able to edit or input different values in these fields, but still retain the overall styling of my initial symbol. So to do that, I can select this, I can double click, and then I can select the field that I want to edit and I can click here on the purple plus and I can select new field. Let's call this plan title. And now this is linked to this element. Let's do another one. Let's select this one that says price point. Again, click new field. We're just gonna leave it like that. And now when I select the other instances, notice we have something called instance overrides. So instead of text here saying starter, I can say pro. Instead of saying $20 per month, I can say $48 per month. These three elements now have different content, even though they are all instances of the same symbol but I can always go back to the symbol and make any kind of stylistic changes. For example, let's say I want this button to have a different top padding. I can do that and notice that 
those changes are reflected on the other element. Or maybe I want to delete this bit. So this change, because I'm making it inside the symbol, is automatically passed to all the instances. But in terms of the overrides, those are unique for each instance. And that's symbol overrides. Now, if you want a symbol instance to no longer be a symbol instance, you can unlink it. For that, simply select the instance and you can right click and choose unlink instance or shift command A. So now that's just like a standalone element and I can go in here and I can make any kind of change that's not gonna affect all the other instances or any of the other instances. And I can even edit the main symbol. Let's, for example, select the button again and let's change the padding. Let's add eight pixels of padding. Now, this was actually a bad example because we are using a, a class here. So of course that change is gonna be reflected here as well. But let's say I want to remove this divider from the symbol. So I remove it from here. That change is being reflected in this instance and in this instance, but this one, which is no longer an instance, still has the divider. And we did that by right clicking and selecting unlink instance. So then in this lesson, we learned about working with symbols in Webflow. And the purpose of a symbol is to reuse content. We learned that we can turn any element or group of elements into a symbol. And we also played around with overrides, which allow us to make unique changes to a particular symbol instance. Finally, we learned that unlinking a symbol will prevent it from receiving any changes made to the other instances. Now, onto responsive websites. This is one of my favorite features in Webflow. And as you can clearly see from my face, I'm ecstatic about it and I can't wait to show it to you. Creating responsive websites nowadays is a must because they need to display properly on whatever devices we're using. Thankfully, this is really easy to do in Webflow. So in this lesson, we're going to learn how to switch between different breakpoints, how to add new breakpoints, and also how the changes we make cascade between different breakpoints. Let's start with switching between breakpoints. You can switch between the four predefined breakpoints by using the top toolbar and clicking on each individual icon, or you can use the one, two, three, four keyboard shortcuts to easily switch between these. This works in both the designer mode, but we can switch to the live view at any time and we can switch between them exactly the same way with the top toolbar or using one, two, three, four. But of course, if we want to see how our page looks like in between some of these breakpoints, we can grab the handle and we can resize the page just like this. And as you can see in preview mode, this will automatically switch between breakpoints. So for example, this second one is tablet or 991 pixels and down. So when I reach 991 pixels, that automatically switches the breakpoint for me. And notice that we have 
several changes here when going from a larger screen to a smaller screen. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But for now, this is how you would switch between breakpoints. And I wanna mention something here. This happens in preview mode, but when we switch back to our designer and we grab that edge of the page and we start dragging, well, there's a slightly different behavior. Let's start with the smallest breakpoint. This is the mobile, and this is 478 pixels and down. You'll notice that when I try to resize the page here, it only does that, or it only uses a range between 479 and 240. And those values are displayed right here at the bottom, so when I resize, I can also snap to various points. And those various points represent screen widths for certain devices. For example, 320 is the screen width for the iPhone SE, 5S and earlier, and the iPod Touch. If I move up, 360 is the screen width for these devices. 375. 390, 414, 428. This is really cool. Not only you have an amazing way of checking your website on various screen sizes, but you also get these predefined ranges. And of course it works the same way for, uh, this is mobile landscape, uh, this is tablet, right? Same thing. Here is the iPad Pro, iPad 2017, 2018, uh, 800 pixels. This is Galaxy stuff. This is iPad Pro 10.5 and so on and so forth. So when we're inside the designer or more specifically when we're not in preview mode, we get limits to how much we can resize this window. But when we're in preview mode, we can resize it across all breakpoints. So then, by default, we have four breakpoints we can switch between, but we can always add more for larger screens. Well, I say more, but it's actually just three. Let's click the menu icon here on the top, and we can add a large breakpoint at 1280, 1440, or 1920. And we can add just one, and that's gonna give it a different icon, or I can add the other ones as well. And notice that once you add a breakpoint to a project, you cannot remove it. And that's it. There are just three breakpoints we can add for larger screens. The, one that, the ones that I showed you earlier. Each has a different or a slightly different icon, but then we can easily switch between them just like we did for the other ones. And notice something interesting. Right now I'm at 19, 20 pixels, but my recording space here or the available space on my laptop is not 19, 20. That's much smaller. So in order to view this page on this size, Webflow automatically scaled the whole image to 50.5%. And you can even see this better in, uh, in preview mode. Right now, because I have a bit more extra width, uh, the scale is at 73.9%. And you'll see that if there's enough room, like for example on a tablet or phone, the scale is at 100%. But as soon as I go much bigger than that, like for example on this or this, then the, uh, the image kind of scales down. Okay, so now that we have a ton of breakpoints 
to switch between, let's see how the changes we make cascade between two screen sizes. And it's actually very simple here. The changes we make will cascade upwards to bigger screen sizes and will cascade downwards to smaller screen sizes. What does that mean? Well, for example, let's say I'm selecting the tablet breakpoint. And this is what our site looks like. But let's say I don't like how close these two buttons are to this text. So I can select the text and I can add some bottom margin. Now this change cascades downwards to the smaller screen sizes. So the mobile landscape will have that change. Notice 40 margin bottom. And also the mobile portrait will have that change. Notice 40 margin bottom. But if I'm going back to my default desktop breakpoint, that element is still at five margin bottom. So the change that I made on this breakpoint cascaded down to the smaller screen sizes. If I'm gonna go to this bigger breakpoint and I'm gonna make a change here, let's say I want this heading to be a different color. Let's say green. Will this cascade down? Well, let's see. No, it doesn't. Because as I said, on larger screens, changes cascade upwards. So this is a large screen, 1280 and up. Let's select the sync across all devices heading and let's change its color to something else like this orange. So now because this is a large screen, the changes will cascade up. So it's gonna cascade up to this breakpoint and then it would cascade up to this breakpoint except we made um, a slight change here. But we can option click to inherit that change. So now you can see this change cascaded up to the other large screen breakpoints, but it didn't cascade down to the smaller screen sizes. And that's how you can make your website responsive, right? You start, of course, designing on the base breakpoint, the desktop, you create your website here, and then you switch between the different breakpoints. You see that, okay, on tablet, this looks pretty good, but let's check it. Maybe I want a different padding here in the section. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's add a padding of 24, 25 pixels. So that change is now happening on tablet. It's happening on mobile landscape. It's happening on mobile portrait. The desktop version is still unaffected. And you just repeat the process. You switch between breakpoints and whenever you feel there's a need uh, for changing things, you can go and make your changes. For example, here on the tablet, uh, sorry, mobile portrait, maybe I want some distance between these two buttons. Therefore, I can select this button and I can add a margin bottom. And that's it. Now, everything looks as it should between breakpoints. And you can see these changes happening in real time when you open up the preview mode and you start going through all the different breakpoints and uh, screen sizes. So then, in this lesson, we learned the basics of creating responsive websites in Webflow. We played around with breakpoints and learned how to switch between them, but also how to add new ones. We also watched in wonder how changes we make cascade upwards to bigger screen sizes, but cascade downwards 
to smaller screen sizes. But I think the most important skill that we learned in this lesson was grabbing the side of that canvas and going. It's truly an art and not everyone can do it. Now let's talk about publishing a website with Webflow. Every website you build with Webflow can be published with Webflow. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about the different ways of publishing, how to export the code and assets, and also how much it's going to cost you. But first, ways of publishing. There are two ways. If you go to the top toolbar and you click on publish, you'll see that we have two destinations. The first destination is for uh, a webflow.io subdomain, and this is selected by default. The second is a custom domain, and this is not selected by default. So with this first one selected by default, let's publish to selected domains. And once that's done, once it's published successfully, we can click on this link to open a new tab to our newly published website. And it's all here exactly the way it was designed in Webflow. But there's one problem. This website address is not very professional. Imagine telling your clients, hey, you can go to my website, Adrian's Fresh Site, 5ADA98 dot webflow dot io. That's not going to work very well. So what you'll end up doing is publishing on a custom domain. But there is a reason this is unchecked by default. It's a paid feature. And currently, we're using the starter plan, which is free. So if you click here, that's going to take you to the billing page, where you can choose one of the plans. And starting with basic, we have access to custom domains. So basic, $12 a month, bill yearly, a bit more when you bill monthly. But there you go. That is a paid feature. Now, if you don't fancy using Webflow for publishing, you can do it the old fashioned way by uploading your uh, website files to a server directly via FTP. But for that, you will still need your static files and assets. Thankfully, you can download those from Webflow by going to the top toolbar and clicking export code. And that's going to generate the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, and even all the assets that are used in the design. But of course, for that, you also need to pay. This is a premium feature. So you will need to upgrade your workspace plan to export all of these assets. How much it costs? Well, let's take a look. Workspace plans start from $19 a month when billed yearly and can go to even higher prices. And that's how you can get the static files. And of course, that also brought us to pricing. You saw how much you need to pay for certain things like uh, publishing on a custom domain or exporting code. And feel free to uh, go to the Webflow official page, check out the pricing for everything they offer. And um, yeah, just make your decision. Then Webflow is an amazing service. But because it's an amazing service, you do have to pay for certain things. So then in this lesson, we learned about publishing with Webflow. We saw that it's super easy to publish and you can even do it on a custom domain for a price. Uh, we learned that it's possible to export the static files for a price. And finally, we took a quick look at said price. All in all, I think Webflow is pretty awesome. So please stick around for the conclusion. And the conclusion is this. All in all, I think Webflow is pretty awesome. 
Normally, I'm not a big fan of these visual builders. I prefer to write my own code. But Webflow is so easy to use, and it actually generates really clean code. And I like that. But what I like the most is how they embedded the principles of working with HTML and CSS in a visual tool, and one that's, as I said, very easy to use. So kudos to them. Now, before wrapping up, let's take a look back at what we've learned in this course. We started by understanding how a website is built and what kind of technologies are used. Then we learned about the box model and how it's the foundation of all layouts. We had a brief life-threatening encounter with a dangerous species, but shortly after we discovered the Webflow designer. Here we learned about the user interface, how to add and edit elements, how to work with classes and inheritance, how to reuse elements through symbols, and we also discovered the basics of creating responsive websites. In the end, we briefly talked about publishing with Webflow, and we learned that we can even publish on a custom domain, of course, for a price. Then came the conclusion, where I said, and I quote, all in all, I think Webflow is pretty awesome, end quote. Then I went on to recapping the entire course and saying the things that I just said 20 seconds ago. So I'll stop here. Thanks very much for watching and don't forget to check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel to learn more about Webflow, WordPress, Adobe XD, Figma, and much more. See ya!